In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your present and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you all. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Give peace, but I pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray. be with you. Let us pray. Everlasting Father, source of every blessing, mercifully direct and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that we may complete the works you have prepared for us to do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of God's word. Our first reading is from the book of Numbers, the 11th chapter. Now the rabble that was among the children of Israel had a strong craving. The people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their fathers? 
where am I to get meat to give all this people? For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. I'm not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. You will treat me like this. Kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. Then the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered. But they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets that the Lord would put his spirit on them. This is the word of the Lord. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Our epistle reading and the text for our reflection this morning is from the last epistle of James, or the last chapter of James's epistle, chapter five. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains? You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. 
The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. For three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. And so as James and Jesus have urged us, let us love one another, brothers and sisters in Christ, that united as one people, we might confess together our common Christian faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our catechism lesson for this morning is the second commandment. And what is the second commandment? 
you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. You may be seated as we sing together our sermon here. And so James says, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person, but also he does not resist you. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So this is the last of our few Sundays where we've spent reading through the epistle of James. It only comes up every three years, but there are so many important things in here, I thought it was worth spending a few Sundays' time reflecting on them. Way back a few Sundays ago, we started with James warning us about partiality, how we use our eyes. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, James said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And the question that James laid before us in James chapter 2 is, are you using your eyes to see the way God sees? A world in need of redemption by his Christ. Or are we too busy, as Jesus warned us not to do in the Sermon on the Mount, figuring out who is good and who is bad, who is worthy of judgment and who is going to escape judgment, who's going to heaven and who's going to hell, instead of simply telling them, about the Christ and what he has accomplished for them. Then in John chapter or James chapter 3, James moved from our eyes to our tongue and warned us of what a great evil is contained in this muscle in our mouths and how we use this tongue both for good and for tremendous evil, sometimes within minutes, if not seconds, of each other. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, James said, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, these things ought not to be so. And again, James is reflecting on his elder brother's words in the Sermon on the Mount when he warned us about how even those who are angry with their brother, have murdered them, killed them with that muscle that sits between your upper palate and your lower teeth. And so, James asked, do we speak as God speaks, calling us to repentance, warning us of the wrath that is to come, but also proclaiming his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness in Jesus? But that is the primary way we should be using our tongues. And then last week, we moved from eyes to tongue all the way down into our hearts. James asked the question that even secular people are constantly asking themselves, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Why does it seem like we are always at each other's throat? Why is nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom, neighbor against neighbor even? Is it not this, James writes, that your passions are at war within you, in your own heart? We want, and we want, and we want, and we want, and we will kill others or even ourselves through work, to try and get it. But now in this last chapter of his epistle, as James has dealt with eyes and tongue and heart, he comes full circle, comes right back to these eyes in our head and what they see. And do we see as God wants us to see? Or do we only see from a human worldly perspective so that really we'd be better off ripping out our eyes and not seeing it all at all? as Jesus talks about in the gospel. How do we judge who has God's blessing in the world? Do we look at their power? 
Do we look at their wealth? Jesus warned people that accumulated wealth, that wealth in this world doesn't last. Moth eats, rust destroys, thieves come in and take by force. James is simply reminding us of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. A warning to you rich that all these things you think make you valuable and important in the world will not survive your death. And death is coming sooner or later for each and every one of us. The rich, James says, are not the ones who are blessed. It's not in wealth and in riches that we can see the love of God. It's not even in health that we can see the love and blessing of God. But actually, God's blessing comes only in Jesus. So I was out in Omaha the last few days with our Jamaican mission partner circle, just like we had our mission partners meeting here in Montreal. Last weekend, we got together at Zion West Lutheran Church on Ida Street in Omaha to talk about the work down in the Caribbean and specifically Jamaica. And there was a pastor and his wife, who are longtime friends of ours, who were sitting at a table with me and our director of Lutheran Hour Ministries. And for some reason, we got into a discussion about capitalism and socialism, probably drawn in part because of their experiences as Jamaicans who had to flee the country as young children when it took a turn from being a more open free market system to one that was controlled very intimately by the government. And as we got to the end of our discussion, it occurred to me that the one thing that is true of every single economic system that we have developed as humans, whether it's free market capitalism or liberalism or socialism or communism or come up with any other economic system, is that in every single method of dispersing wealth, we have always ended up with rich people and poor people. Always. No matter whether it's somebody desperately trying to follow the rules of Marx and communism or in free market capitalism, there always seem to be those who have a lot of stuff and those who seem to be struggling to make ends meet. Now, why is that? Is it not because of us? Because when we get stuff, our immediate instinct is to hold on to it, protect it, build walls around it, put it in a safe, lock it up in a safe deposit box, accumulate it in bank accounts. Anything we get is always something we want to keep for ourselves. And I am as guilty of that as any of you. This is our sinful nature. It is precisely what makes us so different from God. Because how does God use his riches? What does God do with everything that he has, with his most prized possessions? James tells us, right there in James chapter 5, our reading for today. You have condemned and murdered, and listen closely here. This is very important. The righteous one. And he does not resist you. It is singular. Something that not every language has, the singular and plural business. Sorry for those of you who are trying to figure out how this works in English and French and Spanish and other Western languages. But in our languages, we have singular and plural. Just like in Greek. And this is a singular it is not you've condemned and murdered righteous people out there in general, but James has somebody specific in mind. And that specific person turns the other cheek to you and me. It's just like what James said all those many weeks back, if you remember it, in James chapter 2. But you have dishonored the poor man. Not just poor people in general, but James clearly has somebody very specific in mind. The righteous one. 
the poor man, the one we have dishonored, the one we have condemned and murdered, the one who was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed, saved, raised up, all synonyms one of the other. This righteous one, this poor man could have turned around and destroyed us all, but instead he continues to come to us and heal our eyes so that we can see each other and the world the way God sees us. He's taken a coal from the altar and placed it on our tongue that our sins are now forgiven. And now we who have unclean lips can speak good words amongst others of unclean lips. And in the words of Jeremiah, he has taken our hearts of stone that only want to fight and quarrel and murder and given us hearts of flesh that can feel, that can look at others the way God does as people worthy of redemption. People to die for, literally, even death on a cross. So you and I, our eyes have been plucked out. Our hearts have been transplanted. Even our tongue has been rearranged. And it is continually happening to us over and over again by the spirit breathed out over the lips of Jesus as he was dying. So that we can see. So that we can speak. And perhaps most importantly of all, we can love. Not as the world loves. Because the world loves in order to get, in order to accumulate, in order to amass for itself. God loves in order that he might give and give freely and give it all for you. And all of that happens because of the righteous one, the Christ, the one who by grace, though he was rich, yet for your sake and mine became the poor man. So that you and I, by his poverty, might become rich. And so this circles back to that first question that I asked. How do we see God's blessings in the world? How do we figure out on whom God's blessings rest? And so James has these verses that, that seem kind of disconnected, but they all flow together. Are any of you suffering? Well, clearly, if you're suffering, then God must really hate your guts, right? God wouldn't allow that to somebody that he loves. But James turns it all around and says, if you're suffering, do you know who you can bring your suffering to? Your father. Your heavenly father. And so pray. Lay it at his feet. Are any of you joyful? You've got songs to sing. One day, perhaps someday soon, we will have our hymnals again. We'll be reminded that we have a whole collection of songs that are built on the words that our Lord has given us to sing out for joy and to invite each other into our joy to sing with us. And if any of you are sick, it does not mean God's abandoned you. And if you want a reminder that God hasn't abandoned you, call for the elders, the pastor of the church, to come and do what we used to do but have kind of fallen out of the habit of doing, which is anointing you. Now, what is that all about? Well, for hundreds of years in the early church, the first thing that was done to you when you came out of the kingdom of Satan and into the kingdom of God in baptism was that you were anointed with oil. Just like the prophets, just like the priests, and yes, just like the kings. That anointing with oil is to remind you that even though you might lay on your deathbed, you are baptized. God has redeemed you in the blood of Jesus. You are his. He is your father. And you are most certainly blessed above all others, even in your sickness, 
even in mine. And so James says, don't, don't look for the riches or the power as a sign of God's blessing. But even in the midst of suffering and joy and sickness, you can be certain because of Christ's crucifixion for you that God does indeed love you. And he's made you his. And so James, this rather short epistle that maybe some of you have never really looked at, just like Luther called it an epistle of straw at his first reading, turns out to really be an epistle about faith in Christ. It's really what it is. And that's why Luther dismissed it at first, because he was in a battle over the question of what the church is all about. Is it about what we do for God, or is it about what God has done for us? But then Luther reread it, just like we have over the last few Sundays. And I've come to see that really this is an epistle about the righteous one, the poor man. He does not resist you, but instead reaches his arms out to you on the cross. It is an epistle about faith and about trust in the one who makes you and I blessed. And how we see that blessedness and speak that blessedness and even love that blessedness in our hearts. James is an epistle about the good news. The best news. The news about Jesus. Amen. Now may the grace, mercy, and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ guard and keep you always in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Announcements. What is happening in Ascension uh, this week and in the coming weeks? Um, first of all, a little bit of news from my trips. Before I was in Omaha this week, I was in Emporia, Virginia, our southernmost church in our SELC East Circuit. So I was meeting with um, our fellow pastors uh, from New Jersey and Pennsylvania and Connecticut me up in Montreal, and then our two pastors down in Virginia. And in their wisdom, they have decided that they would very much like our next fall circuit meeting to be here. Uh, we haven't had a circuit meeting in Montreal since I've been here. I, I'm not sure if there's been one in this decade, um, but that's going to be, we're going to time it so that it's right before our foro next fall. Um, there'll probably be about between eight and nine pastors that'll be here. Pastor Douthwaite does most of the planning for the agenda. Um, and certainly I've got a good team that can help organize if we want to have a meal. Um, but I am excited, and I think you should be too, to have pastors from across the eastern seaboard come up here and to see what's going on up at Ascension of Montreal. Um, this Wednesday, we resume our study group on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We are going to do a study this fall of the formula of Concord. Um, the agreement of peace, really, is what it is. Um, it was the very last confession of faith that the Lutheran Church wrote that is in our Book of Concord. Um, it is about what we believe and teach and confess. And in fact, every single article of it starts with those words. So that'll be Wednesday by Zoom at 7 o'clock. Um, this Saturday, we have our second open house of the fall uh, from, I believe, 5 to 7 o'clock, 5.30 to 7.30. 5.30 to 7.30, and that will be downstairs in the basement. It is a, um, well, I got to talk to you guys about that, but we're definitely inviting the community to come and we will be handing out um, gloves and mitts, we hope, and some other stuff for winter. We'll be talking a little bit about Premi Quebec. Are they coming to, to do a little bit of conversation about being a refugee and an immigrant in Quebec and what that's all about? And there will be some food as well. So that's 5.30 to 7.30 on Saturday. Um, Reminder that we are still coming out of COVID. Some of you are new to Ascension. And so we did, prior to COVID, have hymnals. And some of you might remember that we had bulletins and we had hymnal displays up here that we knew what songs we were singing. Um, because we didn't want to hand things out, we have asked for people to bring their own worship folder with them or a device that they can get their worship service on. If you have smartphones and you would like to read the service on that, please bring that and we'll get you set up. Um, 
for people that aren't bringing a worship folder or a device, we've been having to print services out and we're going to try and figure out how to do that in a more economical way. Um, but I really do encourage you, if you can, to print out your worship folder and bring it with you. They're posted on the website, ascensionlutheran.ca, or just display it on your device and save a couple of trees. Lastly, there are portals of prayer available in the Narthex. That's our uh, daily devotional for the quarter. Emily, you wanted to give instructions on that? Oh, and you have one more thing after that. Okay. Um, so those are probably, I'm assuming, spread out in the narthex for people to pick out. Um, so make sure to pick one up on your way out for October, November, and December. Emily. We do have two additional prayers. One is for the Millette family uh, on the loss of Robert and David and Michael's aunt, Sue Nagy, who lives here in Montreal, um, and also for the loss of Tejpal Singh which is uh, Rupendra's um, uncle. Um, and so we join in those who are grieving um, in offering them the comfort that comes in Christ. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, Keep us from craving and weeping after what we no longer possess, but instead give us contentment in the daily bread you so graciously rain down upon us. Lord, in your mercy, cause your Holy Spirit to rest upon us and our pastors, that they may prophesy your word publicly and faithfully among us, and that we in turn may prophesy your word in our homes and vocations. Lord, in your, in your mercy. O oh Lord, bless our elders, our church council, our mission team and mission workers, and our ladies aid with the necessary gifts of your spirit, that they may faithfully serve the congregation, support our pastor and deaconess, and uphold the ministry of the word amongst us. Lord, in your mercy. Send forth your spirit, Father, over all couples who desire the gift of children, that they may be fruitful and bring up their children in your fear and knowledge and help couples open up their doors to children who are in need of parents to raise them. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, uphold Her Majesty the Queen, our Governor General, our newly elected Parliament, our Lieutenant Governor and National Assembly, and all those who bear the sword in our land, that sin and wickedness may be kept at bay, and we may live peaceably in lives of security. Lord, in your mercy. Save and raise up those who are suffering or sick. We pray especially for Massey, for Carrie, for Larry, and for all those whom we name in our hearts before you this morning. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, be with those who are grieving, especially Robert and the Millette family at the passing of their aunt Sunegi and the Singh family at the passing of the dear uncle, Tishpal. Lord, in your mercy. Grant, Lord, that all who come to the altar today to receive the heavenly manna of Christ's body and blood would be well salted with repentance and faith and at peace with one another. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, Grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. in your kingdom and teach us to pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. O God, our fountain and source of all things, who in the light of our sin and only God is starting to us, we thank you for the good sake of your heaven, pardon and peace in this battle. I ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds. We must be served Jesus Christ, O Son of all, who lives in the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give, favor and give you his peace. Amen.